Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, the strangest thing happened to me last Saturday. I'm out on a, a run, a normal run, and it's really hot. I don't know if you remember last Saturday, not yesterday, but last Saturday it was like 90 degrees. And typically when I go running, I run in the morning, but I didn't feel well that morning, so it wasn't until the afternoon that I went running. And I'm out maybe mile four, and it's, it's hot and dry. And uh, I didn't uh, drink enough, I guess, before I went running. And so I took this big breath. And oh, also, because it was so hot, I was, you know, sucking air big time. So instead of breathing through my nose like I normally do, all these details, don't you love this? I'm breathing through my mouth. And every time I breathe through my mouth, my mouth gets drier and drier. So I take this big breath in, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And I'm out there running. Going, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that pleasant? And, uh, and it, it didn't last very long, but this is the crazy thing, is, is as soon as my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth, I was instantly taken back 20 years to the last time my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. See, it doesn't happen very often. Um, but uh, 20 years ago, I'm in Kansas. I'm also out on a run. This time it's a long run. I'm, I'm maybe mile 10, mile 11, and it's hot August sun in Kansas. I had a guy come up to me after the first service, and he's like, oh, man, I, I, used to, I was a football coach, you know, in uh, Kansas, and I know what it's like in the summer. So I'm out running. I'm, it's a long way from home. It's hot. I'm breathing desert air, it feels like. And uh, it's 20 years ago, I hadn't really learned how to hydrate properly for long runs. And my body was actually shutting, I didn't realize this, my body was shutting down on me because I just was driving it, it was hot, hadn't had any water, and my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth and I couldn't get it unstuck. And I'm out there like, what in the world? I can't hardly breathe. And I'm like, I'm in trouble here. And again, that wasn't really the big deal. The big deal was that my body was, was trying to send a message to me, dude, you are crazy, stop. But I have this like German blood in me. I don't quit. I don't stop. I'm like, I can make it. So, you know, I, I had turned around, fortunately, and I'm running home, basically stumbling home. And um, I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty that I was almost like hallucinating. Now, where I was running was in, you know, midst all these fields in Kansas. And I know there's ditches alongside the road that are, they've got water in them, but they're full of pesticides and dead animals. And I'm like, I want to just dive into one of those ditches and just lay there, you know, and just drink in the water. I'm, I'm so thirsty. I'm hallucinating, you know, and, um, and uh, I'm, my body hurts and it's crazy. And I'm just like, stop. I know I'm not going to stop. And uh, I finally got home. I get home and I am so thirsty. I grab the hose and I, it's like I, just, I was slurping it up, you know, I'm pouring on my head and I'm just trying to, to get water to you know, refresh me. And I must have drunk two or three gallons. Finally, I'm sitting there with a big bloated stomach, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But it took me four or five days to recover. My body hurt. I'd pushed it so hard. It hurt for four or five days from the dehydration. Now, all of this is in my mind. Last week, when my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth, I was like back in Kansas, and all the, the feelings, the thirst, the I'm dying, my body's shutting down, all these things are running through my mind, and I had to stop myself while I'm running and say, dude, you're, this is four miles. Don't be a baby. You're only a couple miles from home. You're not in Kansas. It's not, not you know, as hot as it was, but... I was feeling the same thirst that I did 20 years ago because the mind's amazing. And it brought me back to all these experiences, all these feelings in my body just shutting down. And I'm like, your body's not shutting down. Four miles is nothing. And I had to tell myself, you're going to be all right when you got home. And I, I thought afterwards, how, how is it possible that my mind could take me back to that dying, desperate thirst? And I I marvel at the, the mind's ability to remember those traumatic experiences. I don't know, have you ever been so thirsty that you feel like you're going to die? If I don't get a hose, if, if I don't get some water, I'm not going to make it. And like I was stumbling into the yard, just, oh, I just need water. Anybody ever been so thirsty you think you're going to die? Um, I mean, you can die of thirst, but uh, thirst is a funny thing. All of us have a physical, you know, physiological thirst. But it is a powerful illustration 
of a deeper thirst. This is, this is the genius of God. He's wired us so that there are physiological things in our life that remind us of a spiritual truth. Here's the truth this morning. Everybody here is thirsty. The question is, do you know how thirsty you really are? Here, here's what I've discovered. Instead of recreationally running in order to get in shape, I know thousands of people, literally, I've been in ministry a long time, I know thousands of people that are running and they're running from God. They're running from something and their body is shutting down, their mind. They're running from their creator. They're running from who God is and God's made us to thirst, but we are satisfied with you know, jump, jumping in ditches. We're satisfied with, with artificial water. We're satisfied with things that won't help us, that might actually kill us, thinking that that will satisfy our thirst. And all the while, we're running away from the one who can satisfy us. You hear what I'm saying? We're all thirsty. And God's made us for himself. And there's part of being made in the image of God is the way God's wired us to hunger and to thirst for him. I want to invite you to stand with me because Jesus is going to say something in John chapter 7 that is so powerful. John chapter 7, verse 37. And even though he said this 2,000 years ago, it's, to me it's like it speaks right to us right here today. You're in Avon Lake. You're in uh, Vermilion here in Elyria. You're on the internet. This word is for you the Holy Spirit is going to speak through his word that he has inspired to your heart. The question is, do you recognize your thirst? Because we have gotten so good at masking our thirst, we've convinced ourselves we're not thirsty. Hear Jesus. Listen to Jesus. John chapter 7, verse 37. <laughs> On the last and greatest day of the feast. This is the feast of the tabernacles. This is um, um, Jesus in Jerusalem. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, the Greek there is actually, he shouted, okay? He cries out. He shouts this. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, Jesus says, and drink. Wow. Is anyone thirsty? Let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, rivers of living water. Yes, Lord. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You may be seated. Let me explain a bunch of stuff that's happening here. That last sentence, John, who's writing this, remembering the things that Jesus said and did, is giving us a commentary at the end, and he's helping us see that Jesus is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit that at the time of the events of John 7 had not yet happened, the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is, you know, he exists, he's always existed, but he hadn't been poured out yet. This idea of Jesus being glorified is, is basically just saying that Jesus, God's big plan was that Jesus would come to earth, he would live, he would do miracles, he would teach, he would die on the cross, they would bury him, he would be raised from the dead, as, a, as God's authentication of his message and, and what, he was, what he was saying, Jesus would be ascended into the Father to live in heaven again, and then he would pour out the Holy Spirit in power. This, we see this in Acts chapter 2. John is, is kind of giving us a wind, window that Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit's coming, and if you'll believe in me, if you'll drink deeply of me, I will give you the Spirit. I will send the Holy Spirit. He will fill you. It'll be like streams of living water. But John says it hasn't happened yet because Jesus hasn't died. He hasn't been resurrected. He hasn't yet ascended to the Father. So the Holy Spirit has not been poured out yet in John 7. But he was kind of anticipating that when that happens, it's going to change everything. Here's a question I have for you. Today. Have you drunk deeply of the gift of the Holy Spirit that God has poured out upon the church? Have you drunk deeply from the 
the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is referring to here, that God was going to pour out and has now poured out upon the church. This is how God invites us into relation. This is how God invites us into all that he has for us. And it comes back to the way he's wired us from the very beginning that we are wired, hardwired. We were made to thirst. When Jesus says here in verse 37, is anyone thirsty? Let anyone who is thirsty come. Who's he referring to? Just the, the disciples that are nearby? No. John says that he stood up, you know, amongst the crowd. The crowd is, is filling Jerusalem because of this big festival. He stood up and he shouted. So why is Jesus shouting? Why does he want, you know, everyone to hear him? Because this message is for everyone. Everyone thirsts. God has made us to thirst. Why? So that we might seek him. This message that Jesus speaks 2,000 years ago is for anyone hearing his voice, anyone who's reading the word of God. Let anyone who thirsts. I'm shouting, John says about Jesus, because I don't want anybody to miss this. Let anyone who thirsts. Well, that's everyone, but the kind of the um, precursor to the invitation of coming and drinking of the Spirit, drinking of the gift that Jesus has, is for those who first realize that they're thirsty. How much are you aware of your thirst for God this morning? Are you tuned in? Are you, are you aware of how thirsty you are? Do you know that God's made you to thirst so you might seek Him? Um, every single human being is made this way. God has placed eternity in our hearts. We're not rocks. We're not stones. We're not biological proteins that have come slammed together. We're not the, you know, the, the, the result of a long evolutionary process. We've been made in the image of God, lovingly shaped. And God's made us, unlike animals and rocks and birds and stuff, we've been made with the image of God, with a hunger for God, the thirst for God. So this thirst is not an accident. It's part of who you are. To be human is to thirst so because you thirst, it's why you get in relationship. It's why you want to be in relationship. Because you're thirsty is why you go to the mall. Because you're thirsty is why you go to the refrigerator. Because you're thirsty is why you earn money to buy things. Because you're thirsty is why you want sex. Because you're thirsty is why you get on Facebook and why you uh, get on um, Instagram. Because you're thirsty, it's why you build relationships with people. Everything we do is driven by deep thirst because everyone thirsts for God, but most don't realize that the thirst they have for all this list of things is actually a masked, deeper thirst of the thirst for God. God doesn't want us to love him robotically. He doesn't want us to love him like machines. He wants us to yearn for him. So he places this hunger, this thirst in us. Most of us, and I say us, I mean humans, have so completely um, ignored the deeper thirst in our lives and sought to satisfy it with other things that we have no idea that that deep Thirst is actually God inviting us and calling us. To be human is not only to thirst, it's to try to satisfy that thirst with lots of other different things. This experience, that buying this, having that, another one of these, being in another relationship. Somehow that'll satisfy the deep thirst in my heart. In fact, all temptation, all temptation really is to satisfy our thirst anywhere else but God. You say, you say wait, wait, wait a minute, Jim. So, you know, if I'm, you know, let's just use thirst physically. If I'm thirsty for something to drink, literally a drink, you're saying that really that's, that I should be thirsting for God and I shouldn't take that drink of water? No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you're thirsty for water and you should go pray instead. I'm saying don't leave God out of your quenching your thirsts. There's nothing wrong with getting a drink of water. There's nothing wrong with, with buying something. There's nothing wrong with having sex. There's nothing wrong with, with doing all the things that God's made us to do. Just don't leave God out of them. The thinking that I can satisfy the thirst apart from God is the nature of sin. See, 
we think sin as I did this wrong thing, I did this evil thing. No, no, you did that thing because your heart is lied to you because sin has darkened your mind and you believe you can satisfy the thirst in you by getting some experience, buying this, having this, doing this, and you think you can do it apart from God. Remember the verse we memorized two weeks ago? If you're, you're a regular part of our church, it was 1 Corinthians 10.31. It happens to be my life, my life verse. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. So eat, drink, have sex with your wife, you're, who you're married to. Um, buy stuff, experience things. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Don't leave God out because leaving God out is what sin is. Thinking that I can do life on myself, that I, by myself, that I can satisfy myself, that I have self-sufficiency, I can, I'm self-centered enough to think that, that I can satisfy myself. That's what sin is, and then it just shows up in deeds. It shows up in things we say. We focus on, you know, the, the things we do and think that's what sin is. No, it's the heart. It comes from the heart. It comes from this self um, Sufficient, independent spirit, I will do life apart from God because that's what I want. That's what will satisfy me. And we compartmentalize life. And do I go to church or I have my devotion in the morning and then I have a real job. I have a real life. Oh, I, I go back to God and we live this compartmentalized dichotomy of life. And God says, no, no, I want to fill all of life. I want you to do life with me. Learn to be in the rhythm of walking with me. This is why I made you. This is why I created you to be in relationship with me. Don't believe the lie that you can do life apart from me and find satisfaction and find the deep fulfillment that I've created for you. And because I know that's about you, I've created you to thirst for me. And because I, I know that thirst is powerful, I know you will pursue other things and hopefully you'll find out that they're empty. They can't satisfy. And you will come to me and sell out. You will surrender all. You will give yourself to me. You will live in relationship with me because I'm the only one that can deeply satisfy. You hear what I'm saying? This is the God's invitation. Church doesn't satisfy you. Reading the Bible doesn't satisfy you. It's God who satisfies you. It's, it's, it's relationship with him and drinking deeply of his spirit and, and living in, in this intimacy with him. The Bible speaks of that and points us to that. And church is a place where we can experience God amongst each other. But church can't satisfy. Bible can't satisfy. God alone. So, so David writes in Psalm 63, my heart, my soul searches for you, seeks you. I'm like a dry and thirsty man in a dry and thirsty desert. I need you. I'm, I'm so hungry, so thirsty for you. Do you know that you were made to thirst for God? And are you pursuing him? Or are you treating God like a hobby? Are you treating God like, um, you know, just this, this thing that you include in your life? Open up your life completely and let God fill you with his spirit. And this is what Jesus is inviting us to when he says, these words, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Friends, that's you this morning. Have you drunk deeply of what Jesus offers you? And I, I love that, the, that John records that he shouted. I, I love that he tells us the detail that this happened. Did you notice? On the last and greatest day of the feast or the festival. Some of you might be wondering, why did you skip over that part? Well, because I want to tell you right now that when Jesus stands and shouts and does it at, at this particular moment, it's for a very good reason. Those of you who were here a couple weeks ago, you remember how we said in the early part of John chapter 7 that John tells us all this stuff that's about to happen um, is happening right around the time of the festival of the tabernacles. John chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, the festival of tabernacles. And I told you we would talk about what that was. There's multiple feasts, multiple festivals that God gave to the people of Israel to celebrate. Every single one of them packed with um, illustrations and meaning of what God was trying to teach his people. Not just festivals for the fun of it. Not just feasts for holiday's sake, but full of meaning, full of teaching. 
And so when we come to the festival of the tabernacles, it's uh, one of, many people considered it, the most popular feast that the Jews celebrated. Um, it's kind of a harvest feast, a harvest festival. And for seven days, they're uh, around October, uh, October 15th to be exact, they're supposed to bring in the harvest. They're supposed to live in little makeshift tabernacles, that is like a little tent. They're supposed to live in these little makeshift booths, these little tents, to remind themselves of how God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. You all know this story. We call it the Exodus. And how when God took them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, they went through the desert and they lived in these little booths, these little tabernacles, because they were camping. It's like a big camping trip, Okay. Never, never thought of the Exodus as a camping trip, but that's what it was. Everybody had made a little tabernacles. And so once a year, they remembered, oh, that's when we lived in tabernacles. That's when we lived in tents. And God provided all we needed. He provided water. He provided food. He provided you know, direction. And he brought us out of slavery, out of sin, into the promised land. And if we would just walk with him and trust him and look to him as our provision, he will provide all we need. And so you've got these stories about how the people were thirsty and they cried out to Moses, have you brought us out here to die? And God said, you know, speak to the rock. Or he said, you know, hit this rock. And it's going to prove, it's going to demonstrate that I am the one who supplies everything my people need. I'm trying to teach, God said, I'm trying to teach my people that I am the one that satisfies. I am the supplier of all their needs. And so I will supply the water in this desert land, which is a picture of their life, in this parched land, which is a picture of their spiritual life. I am the one who will supply the water of life. I am the one who will provide all the, the bread that they need. I am the one who is their supplier. And that was the message that God tried to communicate to the people of Israel as he brought them out of slavery into the promised land. It's still the message he's trying to communicate. As God brings you out of a life of emptiness and slavery and, and life of sin into a relationship with him, he's trying to teach you, look to me for all your provisions. I am the water of life. I am the bread of life. I will give you everything you need. Look to me. Trust me. Believe in me. Drink deep of me. Don't get sidetracked into these other things that offer life, but they're really death, just wrapped up in ribbons and, and pretty things. I, I am the source of life. So the Feast of the Tabernacle Tabernacles is to remind the Israelites once a year, God is our water. He's our provider. He's our food. He gives us everything we need. So every single day for the seven-day feast, the priests, the high priest, would take a golden pitcher, and he would go down through one of the gates in the, in the city walls called the water gate. Has nothing to do with Richard Nixon. <laughs> it's, it's a gate they went through to get water. Okay, that's what water gate used to mean. Um, and so they would go you know, through this gate and they would go to the pool of Siloam, which was fed by the springs of Gehan, this fresh water. He would go in and he would dip into this, this golden pitcher and he would process, because it was a ritual, and he would this processional back through the gate, through the steps, up to the temple, up the stairs, up to the altar, and ceremoniously he would pour out this water on the rock and they would do this once a day, every day during the feast or the, the festival of the tabernacles to remind them as they poured the water on the altar, God is our water of life. He supplies all we need. Now, hold that thought. Remember how Jesus said in John 7 when his brothers said, go up to the festival of tabernacles. And Jesus said, I'm not going up yet. It's not the right time. Remember this? It's, my time has not yet fully come. It's not the right time and we, and we stopped and we taught there for a couple seconds last time that the word time in Greek has, uh, there's two different words. One is chronos, which means it refers to seconds, minutes, you know, hours. It's chronos time. We get our word chronology from that. Then there's this Greek word, which is the word kairos, which means special time, uh, God's time, time of God's anointing, time of God's visitation, time of miracles. Whenever God's going to do something special, he doesn't just do it at 204. It's not a chronos time. It's a kairos moment. It's a time of God's visitation. So Jesus says, I'm not going up to the festival yet. Any time will do for you. Any chronos time will work for you. I'm going up at the right kairos moment, at the right time. When all the things that God wants to do are lined up, that's when I'll go. And that's what's happening in John 7, 37, because just when the priest is pouring the water 
during this ritual. Now it's the right time. It's a Kairos moment. Just as he pours the water and everybody remembers that God's the one who gives the water of life. God's the one that provides for us. At that moment, Jesus says, anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink. Are you with me? Do you, what do you think the Jews were thinking when he said that? They're like, what? How audacious. At the moment that we're reminded that God, the one God, provides water, provides food, provides direction, gives us all we need. He is our supply. At that moment, you choose to stand and shout. It's not a small thing. You stand to shout at that moment and say, if anyone's thirsty, as water's being poured on the altar, are you thirsty? Come to me and drink. Like we said last week, Jesus is either a lunatic He's a liar, or he's exactly who he says he is, the water of life, the one who refreshes us. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and we should learn to drink deeply of him. Do you see the right moment here? See, God's kairos moments are so powerful. When we see the timing, when we see what God's doing, how Jesus chose just the right moment, we want to pray to be open and receptive to God's kairos moments when God says, now is the time. I mean, we have an illustration in uh, uh, any sport has Kairos moments. Since we're, uh, and I like football more than baseball, I'll use a football illustration, right? So football. Um, the most important people on the football team is the offensive, li- offensive line. Nobody believes this, but it's true. Offensive line, the biggest guys. And so they, they block and create an opening so the quarterback who gets all the attention gives the ball to the running back who gets a second amount of attention. And he is supposed to hit that hole, run through that hole that's been opened up in the defense by the offensive line blocking. All the big guys are loving this. Um, if he hits the line at the right time, it's a Kairos moment. If the running back gets to the line before the guys have blocked and created an opening, he missed his moment. He's just going to run into their backs. There's not a place to go. If he gets there too late, the fence will close in and tackle him. But if he hits it just the right moment, when it's just open, like Ezekiel Elliott did all the time last year, he'll bust through that line into the secondary. Now it's, ooh, anything could happen now. It's going to be a touchdown. And so every time you see an offensive line opening a line just in time, the running back runs, so that's a Kairos moment. The best running backs hit that moment just right, and they score. In every sport, there's a Kairos moment. In every person's life, there's Kairos moments that are, are opportunities that you don't want to miss. And Jesus is saying, this is my Kairos moment right here. Listen, I have come. I want everybody in Jerusalem to hear this. I want everybody who's in this ritual. I want all the priests. I want everybody who's gathered here to hear me. In a loud voice, I'm saying to you, are you thirsty? Come to me and drink. Friends, when you hear Jesus say that, don't just go, oh, drink. When Jesus says, come to you, says to you, come to me, drink deeply. Come to Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Um, Drink deeply. You say, well, how, how, how do I do that? How do I drink deeply of Jesus? Simply this, I believe. I believe what you say. I I look to you. I intentionally turn my attention to you. Fill me. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, come to me and drink. Then he says, whoever believes in him, out of him will flow rivers of living water, and they will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who have believed in him were yet to receive. Here's what I want you to see. The phrase, come to me, in verse 37. The phrase, believe in me, in verse 38 and receive the Holy Spirit are all the same thing. They're all words. They're all descriptions of us surrendering our life to God or us turning to Jesus Christ and saying, fill me. I want to, I want to come to you with my life. I want to drink deeply of what you have to offer. I don't fully understand all of it, but I turn my life to you. I believe I was made to be in relationship with you, and I admit that I've tried to satisfy my thirst with all these other things, but I'm now turning to you And I want all that you have for me, God. I'm open. Pour into me. See, it's the strangest thing that we can get satisfied with being thirsty. We're like wilted plants. So forget the metaphor about the runner who's, you know, stumbling. And now let's think of the metaphor of a wilted plant that's 
that it has been watered, but it has been, hasn't been watered in a while now. It's not been poured into for a while. And it's starting to wilt and it's just drooping. Anybody have plants like this in their house? You don't have to raise your hand. Um, you know, I, I see plants like this and they're just wilting. All they need is some water. And have you ever watered a plant in the morning and come back in the afternoon and it's like, whoop? If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch this. Here we go. This is your soul wilted. Holy Spirit wants to pour his water and bring you to life. Amen? Just whoop, just like that. I love this. That's just a real quick picture of what God has you know, shown us in nature, which reminds us of our, of our soul. Here's the truth for some of you today. Your ground, your life, your, your, the soil of your heart is dry, parched. You didn't realize it, but God's brought you here today to pour into you. He wants to pour his grace into you. He wants to pour his love into you. He wants to pour his forgiveness into you. He wants to pour his power into your life. He wants to pour encouragement, comfort, presence. He wants to, he wants to pour whatever it is that you need, not what you think you need, but what you need, he wants to pour into you. And like that wilted plant, he wants to see you come to life. Write this down. The Holy Spirit is life-giving water for our parched, dry soul. Are you honest enough to say this morning, I'm thirsty? Are you honest enough to say this morning, I want more of what God has? I don't want to live wilted. I don't want to live in yesterday when I used to be, you know, vibrant and alive. I, I want to live, as Jesus said in John 10, 10, full of life, full of abundant life. I want to be a plant that's well watered. I want to be rooted by the streams of God's Holy Spirit where he's refreshing me and, and nourishing me and bringing me to life because I wasn't meant to thirst but never be satisfied. I wasn't meant to thirst but to drink in ditches. I was made to thirst and seek God and be filled with his presence and Holy Spirit. So I live vibrant and live alive. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, will pour into you, bringing you to life. Um, remember this, this verse in Romans 5, 5, where Paul says, this is what God's doing. God's love has been poured out, I love that phrase, poured out into our lives. Who? How? By the Holy Spirit. So the love of God fills us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that love helps us to know that we matter, that God loves us, that God wants to fill us right here, right now. I had someone come up to me after the first service, and you could just see the yearning on her face. She was like, I want to be filled. I, I, want, I want whatever God has for me. I, and I, I just sensed the Holy Spirit saying, she needs, to be, she needs to feel the love of God. So I said, can I lay my hand on your shoulder? And I just prayed for her that God would fill her with his love. And I don't, don't know her, her story, but she was not feeling loved. She was feeling like she didn't matter. And so God's love gets poured into our hearts. And God's love is a healing love. Did you know that? This is the amazing thing about God's love. When he fills our hearts, he heals the damage because we've all been damaged. He heals the wounds. He heals the things that have happened to us that we've tried to forget and push down. He heals that and he, he heals the brokenhearted and brings life by the power of his spirit, by the power of his love. And that's why you're here today. He wants to pour into you. He wants to fill you know, your cup. He wants to fill your life with his presence. You know, I brought this cup along today. It's, it's, um, it's dry. It's, it's, it's meant to hold water or something, but right now it's, it's bone dry. Nothing in it. Some dust just came out. <laughs> and this represents our lives. We're made to be full. So many of us are just walking around bone dry, empty. There's no life there's no color. There's no vibrance. And we break easily and we're hollow and 
This life is not meant to be brittle and hard like this. We're to be filled with his presence. And, and God, by his Holy Spirit, let me put this here so I don't make a mess. God, by his Holy Spirit, wants to pour into us his life-giving water. This is all Jesus is saying. I, I made you to be full of my presence, but you're walking around empty. I don't want to just for you to be a quarter filled. I don't want you to be a half filled. I want you to be completely filled. Jesus said, come to me and drink, and out of you will flow streams of living water. In fact, look at that phrase. You notice in verse 38, the end of the words, when he says, a living water will flow from within. I have that circled in my Bible. Flow from within. Some people have taught that what this means is that you know, all of us have little divinity inside of us, and once we get in touch with God, then and we awaken that that divinity, that spark of divinity in us, and it just starts to flow out. That sounds so good, but it is so dangerous and wrong. You don't have a spark of divinity in you. What you do have is the echo of God inviting you. What you do have is the thirst he's created in you, but you're not divine. There's not even a spark of divinity in you. You're human, but God, who is divine, has created you in his image to hunger for him, to thirst for him. There's an echo of his voice in your heart that you might respond, that you might cry out and say, thirst, you know, fill me, pour into me. I'm, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty for your presence. And when we do, he fills us as we are meant to be full of him. Now, this verse says, flow from within. As I pour in, God doesn't want us just to be filled. He wants us to overflow. So as he pours into us, we flow. And now what he's pouring into us is coming from within, spilling out. And I'm not making a mess. This is on purpose because this tray right here, this, this bowl right here represents the world that you and I live in. God pours into us, fills us, makes us alive. And then that overflows into the world that we live in. So how does God pour out his love? And to your neighbor, by pouring into you, and you overflow into your neighbor's life. How does he pour out his spirit upon a nation? By anointing his church, by filling his church with his presence, and it overflows. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. God filled them with the spirit, and they overflowed out of the upper room into the streets. And all of a sudden, people are like, what's going on? God's moving. And God wants to move in your, in, your, in your village. He wants to move in your neighborhood. He wants to move in your workplace. And he will do that by filling you, Christian, with his spirit. So you overflow into your world, in your workplace, wherever you are. Overflowing by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so people around you can taste and see that the Lord is good as they taste the overflow from your life. You're not here for yourself. You've been placed in the world so he could pour into you and overflow. Does this make sense? You know, you could fill this out on your blank. The Spirit pours into us to overflow to others. That's why if you just read this passage and say, Jesus says, come to me if you're thirsty and, uh, and, and drink, and you think it's just for you, and you miss the last part of verse 38, um, that rivers of living water will flow from within you, from within them, that, that flowing from to the world is already a picture. It's a hint of how God wants to live, wants us to live out of the overflow. So let's not let our self-centeredness get, you know, trip, trip, trip us up again. Even God's spirit being poured into us, it's not for us. It's not for us to have an experience. It's not for us to be lifted up. God pours into us whatever he pours in for others. And so we live out of that overflow. This is the spirit-filled life. This is how God intended it. It's not the luxury life. It's not the second-level life. It's not for special people. It's for everyone. And we would live out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit. And so not just on Sundays, but every moment we're saying, fill me. Notice how Jesus loves these, these uh, illustrations of breathe, drink, eat. You know, breathe in my presence. I'm the holy breath of God. Breathe in. You know, eat from me. I am the, I am the bread of life. Uh, drink. I give water of life. All these, these illustrations that are so easy to understand, they're all you know, the, the cardinal elements of life. And Jesus fills them and says, I am the bread of life. I am the breath of God. I am the water of life. I'm just trying to say to you that all around you is echoes, is illustrations of how I want to fill you and how you live and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me pour into you. Is anyone thirsty? Let them come to me and drink. Let me just make it real practical right now. Is anyone hearing my voice as a servant of God? 
Is anyone hearing the voice of Jesus through the word of God? Is anyone hearing Jesus say, come to me and drink? Then don't just sit there. Drink. And you say, well, <laughs> it's that metaphor. I don't, I don't get that. How does that work? The simple words. Come to me and drink were illustrated so beautifully for me this past Wednesday as I'm, I'm sitting on my front porch typing away, writing this sermon and uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and thinking about how uh, the water of life refreshes us. How do, we, how do I help people see how to drink what God has for them? And all of a sudden, it thunders. <laughs> I love this. And I'm like, ooh, okay, and lightning. And the next thing I know, it's pouring down rain. And I'm like, oh, God, pour. Pour out. Do it on Sunday. Pour out your spirit. Just like it's raining right now, and then pour out your spirit on Sunday. Love people. Let them know that they're loved. Fill them with your presence, your power, your forgiveness, whatever they need. God, pour. And God says, I'm going to. I'm going to. Now, here's what I want you to see. Look out. So I'm looking out. What do I see? And so simple. There's my driveway. And there's my lawn. I said, what do you notice? I said, well, the driveway is all kinds of rain coming on it, but it's just bouncing off, literally bouncing off and running away. That water, that, you know, that, that cement's getting wet, but it's not getting nourished. It's not getting refreshed. It's not getting, you know, not growing. The cement driveway is not growing in front of me, but the lawn, it's, I, I almost hear the water, the lawn going, tss, 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 tss. you know, it's about time somebody waters. The owner of this house won't water us. God from heaven, you know, boom. And, and I can just hear the grass. I'm making this up now, but it's like almost as if I can hear the grass go, yeah, just drink in God's water. And it's just the Holy Spirit just said, don't be a cement slab that just sits there and lets the water of God just bounce off. Be receptive. Drink deeply. You were made like grass and lawn. You were made to be refreshed by the Spirit of God. Just open yourself up and drink deeply. It's not that hard. And I'm like, oh, God, help me to preach that. I'm, I'm excited on my porch. I think our plants were getting saved as I was just, you know, <laughs> getting excited about it. And I, I'm like, God, do that Sunday. Help me to explain it. It's a metaphor, but it's something you can all understand. Just open your life like a flower to the sun, like a lawn that's parched to the rain, and let it just land in your life. You be receptive. If it helps you to think of a cement driveway versus a lawn, then say something like this. It might be crazy, but Lord, I don't want to be a driveway. I don't want to be a cement slab. I want to be a lawn that's drinking, and I want to be a plant that's planted by the streams of living water. I want to be alive in your presence. I want, I want you to fill me and bring me to life. I want all that you have, God. And you can just pray that simply. You can just pray, God, help me to drink deeply, not just for me, but so that I can love well. You've planted me at my job. You've planted me in my neighborhood. You've planted me in this family. You've planted me in this generation. And you want to pour out your spirit. I want to drink deeply so that I can love the world that you've placed me in well. Not with my supply, but with your supply. So let's close your eyes right now. And Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you to just to come and pour out your presence upon your people. And when I say stuff like that, some people get nervous. Some people get an idea of what that might look like. Help us to just lay aside all that, that we think that might be. And just let you pour out your presence, not in our preconceived notions, but that we just open ourselves to you. And Lord, I know there's dry souls hearing my voice in Vermilion and Avon Lake, here in Elyria, throughout the internet. There, there's people who have come to church today dry, who turn on the internet, they're dry, and we need your spirit to be poured out upon us to forgive us of our sin, to fill us with your love, to heal us, to empower us to serve, to give us the power to witness and to share who you are, to give us gifts that we can use to to build the church and to strengthen the church and to love our neighbor and to, to be the church of Jesus Christ in this world. God, pour out your spirit and meet each one of us where we are. And may no one hearing my voice be a cement slab 
that your blessings just bounce off of, but every, but may every one of us be like this, this open lawn, open to the heavens, this field that you can pour out your refreshing, that times of refreshing might come upon us. I pray this for us as individuals. I pray for this as couples, as families. I pray for this as, as a church. Pour out your spirit, God. Bring life. May we respond, Jesus, to your invitation. Is anyone thirsty? Then let everyone, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. God, we open our lives to you. Let's all stand to our feet. And if you're, if you're comfortable with this, maybe you just open your hands like this in front of you or to the side of you, down by your side, whatever. It's just a physical way of saying, I'm open. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, pour on us, in us, overflowing in us. Yes. And on our part, we just say, yes, Lord, I come. We say, yes, Lord, I believe. These simple words. Yes, Lord, I receive. Do what you want to. Awaken some of us to our thirst that we've pushed down, that we've been satisfied to fill with polluted water. Awaken us to our thirst for you. Make us alive to you so that we cry out, fill me, pour into me. Because Jesus himself said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Fill us today, Lord Jesus, we pray.